what a joy it is to be with you today, and I appreciate the invitation from the now United Women in Faith, as well as from Reverend Jim Parsons, and we wish him well today as he takes a break. My husband Terry was introduced to you a while ago. Terry and I have been on this journey since we were teenagers, and we're very grateful for all these years together. I was the pastor of Reverend Jim's home church, University City in Charlotte, 20 years ago, and his parents had a wonderful ministry, a puppet ministry, and at that time, Jim was in seminary. Uh, It's a joy now to serve with Jim on the conference, Congregational Vitality Team, and we meet regularly, and so that's been a wonderful reconnection for me uh, to be with him. And on this UMW Sunday, I said it already, in United Women in Faith, you've been through a name change, but I remember my mother, I'm a preacher's kid, so I grew up in Methodist parsonages. My mother was a member of the Women's Society of Christian Service, WSCS. So it's not the first time there's been a name change. When we united in the 68 merger with the Evangelical United Brethren, we became the United Methodist Women. I was at first high point as a young mother. Terry and I had just moved there, and I became active in United Methodist Women. And it was during that time that I felt my call to ministry. Now remember, this is unusual because I'm already married and two small children, but my United Methodist Women stood behind me in my call, and they gave me a scholarship to go back to school, finish a degree in Christian education at High Point University, and to go on to Duke Divinity School. And also the conference, United Methodist Women, helps support that. So I'm very grateful to having been and continue to be as a pastor, a strong supporter of what it means to be a United Methodist woman. Your mission has not changed. And today we're going to focus somewhat on the what is the mission now here at Milford Hills. And the scripture that I've chosen It is Transfiguration Sunday, and I'm so glad that you've covered that in terms of the children's time because Jesus is showing us what it means to be changed and how he wants our lives to change. So the scripture that I have chosen is the one that you've used in Transformation Journey, and it comes from Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ. And individually, we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. This is the word of God for we, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. 
Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be found this day acceptable in your sight. For you alone are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. When our son was growing up, uh, one of his favorite toys was that of a transformer. And if you guys would advance the slide there, they can see what a typical transformer toy used to look like. And they still do. The transformer was usually something that looked fairly benign, such as on the, on the slide there, it's a truck. But if you turned it a certain way, it became a menacing robot or some other configuration. But the point was that the child understood that you couldn't change it if the child didn't exert that force onto the transformer toy. Sometimes we might want to wonder, well, how do we change? Especially our self-destructive habits. Uh, whether it's giving up smoking, conquering other addictions, changing the way we eat, the way we handle conflict, the way we respond to criticism. Many of us struggle with how to change ourselves for the better. And one thing seems clear. Most people need some outside force helping them to make that change. It might be a parent, a trusted friend. It could be a, groups, a group of caring people. Either way, we need support and encouragement from others to make the difficult changes in our lives. And most people in recovery from alcohol or drug addictions will name that the force that changed them was their higher power, and the higher power is what we call God. God was the only force in their lives that were, was able to finally lead them to change their lives from addiction to a life of sobriety. Now, even though it's been said that the only certainty is change, none of us really like it. It's hard because it, there's a comfort level in things staying the same. Uh, we want to be able to be predictable. It gives us a sense of security and safety. I love the old story about the farmer who had a barn that was falling apart. His poor cows would gather there at night and they shivered in the cold winds that blew through the, the openings in the walls and then they were drenched in the rain that came through the, the roof. And so finally the old farmer was able to build a new barn. He was pretty excited about it. Put out the call, the cows came back to where he expected them to come into the new barn and they walked right past to where the old barn had been totally exposed to the elements, but it was what they remembered. Coming this far from the COVID pandemic, I think we can be a little bit like those habit-formed cows. Our church in Mooresville welcomed a new clergy couple, Tony Ruth and Wes Smith. This summer, our pastor, Jan Britton, had retired. And so Tony Ruth and Wes spent the summer having uh, conversations with groups of us all through the church, had them in people's homes or at the church. And after it was all done in the fall, one of the things that they shared about a bit of frustration was that it seemed that so many people kept asking, when can we go back to the way it was before the pandemic? And the truth is, and they know it, we can't. It's not going to be like it was before. Our pastors know that now we have to go forward. We have to take what we've learned and recognize that that barn before has been torn down. And the truth is, it had some leaks before the pandemic. I mean, think about it. How many churches, including probably yours, and ours, and across the nation, before the pandemic, was already worried and concerned about declining attendance in worship and in Sunday school. Where are the young people? Why can't we have more children? 
Those questions were already among us before the pandemic. The pandemic just brought a lot of things to the surface and not all of them were bad. I can remember when um, I was a district superintendent as, as she shared with you in the Northern Piedmont District and I would have two contrasts sometimes. I'd go to a church that would admit because I would look at their statistics and they had not had an adult conversion to faith in over 20 years. There had not been an adult, new adult Christian in their midst. On the other hand, I would go to a church that would say, I remember when the church was just running over with children and on Easter Sunday, we had to bring in chairs. Why can't we be like that again? We were already needing to make some changes before COVID hit. But when it did, you experienced it. You had a week's notice to pivot and be able to offer church online as you are continuing to do and you should. And I celebrate that. Choirs had to adapt. They couldn't rehearse together. Some choirs, uh, people would um, record their singing individually and then a savvy tech person would put it all together and we would see it on that, that Sunday's uh, live broadcast. It was a hard time. During COVID, we couldn't see each other. My husband spent five days in the hospital with COVID and the only way we could talk to each other was text or phone. I couldn't go visit him. Our pastor prayed for us by phone. And yet, all of us here can relate to the things we lost during COVID. But folks, here we, here we are. In ways, we are survivors. And now we have a responsibility. It's a lot like when Jesus brought his disciples up on that mountain and they saw him transfigured and it was extraordinary. And you remember uh, Peter and, and John, they were like, could we just stay here? Could we just build some tents and just stay in this moment? And Jesus said, we have to go back down and get back into ministry. This is like this pause we had during COVID taught us a lot about how much more intentional we have to be about relationships, about truly paying attention to people, spending time with people. It's time now that we get to it in our ministries. You started Transformation Journey before COVID and Jim Parsons has shared with me that it was one of the things that kept you going. It kept you focused when, when other churches literally just kind of gave up and shut down and didn't think about ministry. It kept you focused on doing ministry. And you should be very proud of the work that you've done. He particularly wanted me to be sure and thank you. And especially AVL people. You guys were rock stars you kept things going. You did a great job for me this morning. This continues to let you connect with the people online and how important that is. Here's the interesting thing. Churches across our conference are reporting that their online participation people have continued. In fact, some have become contributors and some have even joined. It's a whole new mission field to say, what does it mean to connect regularly with somebody who doesn't live here, but is part of our online congregation. We celebrate that who would have thought over two and a half years ago that any church of any size could have a gospel impact literally worldwide. I just think it's extraordinary and it's something that we have to live into as to what it means to be the church and proclaim the gospel with this kind of technology. He also wanted to thank the, um, your teams that worked with the transformation guides that we sent in. And your guides were Jason Moore, who of course taught you about both and worship and continues to be a consultant for our conference. Luke Edwards, who's in our conference staff and Fresh Expressions. And Kyle Thompson, the pastor of uh, South Park Church in Charlotte. And Jim said that with Luke and the listening team and Kyle and the long-range planning team, we started kind of all over the place, but with their guidance, time, and prayer, we've ended in a very positive place. And with the listening team, we heard a call 
to focus on children, youth, and young adults from our congregation and from our neighbors and community. With our long-range plan, he said, you now have a plan of action of going forward. He said, we don't have definite answers for everything yet, but we understand our community better, our buildings better, and we have direction. And Jim said, I could not have done this for my congregation alone. I'm too close and have my own thoughts and feelings about things It was wonderful that I could simply participate, not as a facilitator or a director. And to me, it was one of the best gifts of the Transformation Journey experience. So let's just look real quickly at what is this clarity that you have gained as a congregation, and I celebrate it with you. But you had three distinct things. It's that how are you going to live into your mission? Your mission is to love, serve, and live as Christ. So... A vision is what are you going to look like when you do that? So if you'll see on the um, beginning of the slide there, you're going to love as Christ does by creating a safe and welcoming space for people to truly feel they belong. Meeting people where they are, building deep consensus and relationships without judgment. That's huge. Because quite frankly, folks, we're not used to really being intentional about relationships. This is about going past, hi, I'm glad you're here. This goes beyond platitudes to genuine caring. The second one is, what does it look like when we serve as Christ in this community, in this Salisbury area? Well, you've chosen to say, we're going to be like the Acts 1-8 model of missions, which is to serve locally, regionally, and globally. It means being committed to reaching the children, youth, and young adults in our community, supporting and enabling our existing local ministries. And your third one, how are you going to live as Christ did? You're going to do it by building authentic relationships with your neighbors. Reflecting and honoring the diverse community we live in and following a path that leads to being faithful and compassionate disciples of Jesus Christ. In the conference, the Western North Carolina Conference, we have said that the mission of the church, which certainly parallels what you've just said, is to follow Jesus, make disciples, and thereby transform the world. Because we understand, and one of the things I want to just reinforce for you, transformation happens when we allow God to work in our lives. It's not something we can do by ourselves. Paul writes in this passage from Romans that our transformation is going to happen because we allow God to renew our minds Is that just so we'll get smarter? It's so that we're more insightful. In fact, he uses that wonderful phrase, this is going to happen so that something amazing is going to happen. The so that, this is the promise that we may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Those of you that came to the workshop uh, when you started Transformation Journey, one of the things that was emphasized about vision was you have to keep asking, what is the will of God? Help us discern where God is calling us and that churches slide into decline when they stop asking the vision question. What is God calling us to do? What is God telling us is acceptable, good, and perfect. God wants to help us make the right choices, to make the right decisions, be able to use our minds to discern God's will for such a time as this. And set in this biblical context, then we understand that transformation must begin by allowing God to work in our lives and especially in our minds. And this is why we caution people that Transformation Journey is not a program. It's not a kit in a box. 
of the 30-some churches that we have worked with, each one had different recommendations, different approaches, because it needed to be contextual. There is no one-size-fits-all, but there is one God. There is one Jesus Christ. And when we align ourselves with what the Holy Spirit is doing, it becomes clear. And each church has its own awakening as to how to live out the great commission of Jesus to make disciples and to transform the world. It will not guarantee that your church will be overflowing with children. It will not guarantee that you will always be here. Being a part of God's work means that you go forward on faith whether or not things work exactly like you thought they would. God has a bigger plan. But I want to share with you some practical changes that we have seen not only in Western North Carolina but across the nation that are working for churches where they're seeing fruit. And I hope this doesn't surprise you that one of the most common denominators is that the churches that are thriving have an intentional prayer life. Some of them have designated prayer rooms in their church that are staffed by volunteers, some of them as much as 24 hours a day. And they pray at stations in that prayer room the prayer request of their own congregation, but then the prayer request from the community. And they let the community know. How do they do that? How do you know how to pray for the police in Salisbury and your immediate community here, for the fire personnel, for social services, for the schools, the teachers, their administration? How do you know what they need? You ask them. This is a part of that going out and engaging people. This is relationship building. This is the walking up and say, I care so much about you. Help me understand what you're up against. How can we truly pray for you? And then you follow up. This is building relationships. Understanding that we pray not just for us. We pray for us collective of a whole community. You're going to be starting a Lenten prayer emphasis. It's the next right step for you. So here's some other things that are working that I want to challenge you a little bit. Here's some change factors. So instead of trying to attract people to come to your church to be here, the change that is most effective is to think in terms of what Jesus said, go. Go where the people are. You are surrounded in your communities where you work, where you go to the grocery store, where your children go to school. Those are the people you encounter regularly. Be more intentional. Go to them. Find out more what they need. This speaks directly to your mission your vision of meeting people where they are and building deep connections and relationships without judgment. It also fits your model of the Acts 1-8 mission of going out locally, missionally, globally, and being committed to reaching those children, youth, and young adults. I'm going to say a little bit more about that in just a minute, but let's insert here right now. The change that so often needs to happen in churches is centered around offering what's called radical hospitality. In the book by Bob Farr and Kay Catan, 10 Prescriptions for a Healthy Church, they talk about hospitality as much more broad than, hello, we're glad you're here. That's good. Please do that. But hospitality needs to start in the parking lot. It needs to be a part that permeates everything that a person encounters at your church when they come here. Ken, you do have great signage. Thank you. It was great to know where to park. It was great to be able to find you inside. Not all churches do that. But they emphasize that every a part of your facility says something about who you are and what you can be. And here's the caution if we do get people here and they are ready to make a commitment to our church, 
the first question that you ask them is not, what can you do for us? You know, it's kind of funny. We'll get somebody, especially if they're younger, and if we're not careful, one of the first things we'll say, want to work with the youth? We didn't want to, but we want you to, right? Am I, am I somewhere close to the way we tend to treat new people? I see a few nods. Thank you. The rest of you, it's okay. But here's the question we've got to ask a new person. Remember, we're committed to helping them grow closer to Christ. So the question is, what do you need to grow closer to Jesus? How can we help you do that? Serving as your youth counselor may or may not come after that. A service will of some kind. And then ask yourselves, if we're going to bring new people in, or you have this dream of lots of families and children and, and youth, then who's going to be the mentors for them? Who's going to teach them the faith? Who's going to be the role model? I pray to God it's you. And that you're willing to ask, what do I need? to grow deeper in my Christian maturity. The third thing I want to lift up is change. This should not be a shock, but families have changed. People are marrying later in life. Uh, Sometimes they're having fewer children, if any, and they're having those children later in life. Grandparents may be the ones who are rearing their grandchildren. And children in families of divorce The non-custodial parent has visitation usually every other week. So that means that children in divorced households may not be available to your church except for two Sundays a month. So think about that. Oh, and by the way, they play sports on Sunday. I've got twin granddaughters on a soccer field this morning. Am I happy about that? No. No. But what I would be happy about that would be a church that would offer worship on a weeknight and maybe a meal instead of fussing about the fact they're not in church. Are we willing to think Sunday plus? Are we willing to think if we offer it on Sunday, could we also offer it again in the week for families that, oh, and by the way, people also work on Sunday. I've got a son and a daughter, as you heard in the introduction, in careers that required a certain amount of Sunday work. Churches told them, too bad. So just to reiterate, the change of wanting to have these people in our midst, I just want to suggest that you reach out not only to children and youth and families, any age, Because we need that full spectrum of generations. And it's you, these older generations, and I am one of you, turned 71 two weeks ago. Here we are, folks. It is not our turn to say, y'all take care of it. We've done our part. And I want to say to you that adult spiritual formation is just as important as ministries for children and youth. The fifth change is that Boy, the neighborhood changed, didn't it? You've mentioned it in your mission statement, that the desire to reach out and address diversity, it's here. Are we willing to learn how to engage with people who are different, especially people who have a second language away from English? How do we learn how to do that? Who can help us and how do we try? And finally, are we willing to talk to the people that we want to serve? You know, too often churches make assumptions about what people want or need, and they didn't sit down and say, how could we help? What really matters in your life? Sometimes we're presumptuous. It would be easy in all this upheaval and change around us just to long for that old leaky barn of the past because it was comfortable in our mind just because it was always there. But we have to remind ourselves it wasn't ideal. And maybe the same God who brought the exiles out of Babylon and back to Jerusalem to rebuild it, maybe the same God who sent his son Jesus, 
who died and rose again for our salvation. Maybe the same God who spoke through Paul in our scripture today is the very God who's going to take us through all these changes. And they will be for the better. And in Paul's scripture today, he said, and this is how we're supposed to behave. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. I asked Reverend Parsons what he thought y'all were the most excited about from Transformation Journey, and he kind of summed it up when he says, I think we feel closer to God and more connected as a congregation. We're, we feel like we're all on the same team, and we're ready for what God has in store for us. So we've got a lot of diverse thinkers here, but somehow at church you guys listen to each other, you respect one another, and good things are coming out of it. People feel heard. He said, we're finding common ground. We're simply being the church. And people are excited about that. Brothers and sisters, if you're longing for these other folks to somehow give you a future, I just want to assure you, the future of Milford Hills is seated right here. And I invite us to join together in your breakthrough prayer. We're going to have it on the screen and let's say it together. Powerful God, deeply and gently break through our lives. We are ready to be used by you to do more than we could ever imagine. Amen.